2012 marks the anniversary of 10 years of us starting Wailad Living Soils. Now back in 2002 we had our first seminar uh, in October, that's why we had this in October, and little did we know that we'd be still going and expanding 10 years later. But it's been a very, very exciting journey. And the journey's been really most exciting by my customers. I say to people, I just love my customers. I just love my clients, you know, of what we do. Because I get so much energy back from any, everyone and all your results as well. So welcome. I know there's some new people to uh, the seminar today. There's quite a few new people. So uh, welcome. And I hope you find uh, this three days exciting. And then we're going to inspire you and empower you to go home and be able to make those changes that you really need to change in your farming practices that it's going to take you into the future as well. We are going to have, um, and the sheet got left out of this booklet, uh, a, you're going to set some objectives today and do some actions. So as soon as that sheet's passed around, we'll pause because I really want you to set some changes that you want to make down now and as you go through the three days, uh, you'll be able to put some actions to them that when you go home, this is just not a whole lot of knowledge to you that this is actually, you're going to take action on it because knowledge without action is, is not very powerful at all. So we're going to make this a really invigorating, inspiring workshop that you're going to be able to go home and the ones who are doing it, then you know you might pick up something else and it will inspire you to keep going as well. Now, um, I'm going to start just a small presentation and I'll hand over to Bill to talk about where we came from. Um, back in 2001, and our first speaker today after our introduction is Carolyn, who started to guide us through this whole process back 11 years ago. We started it on the property. So I'm going to just hand over to Bill now and he can talk a little bit about um, our property and where we came from to where we are today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the farm is east of Young, 19 kilometres. Uh, it's 1,100 hectares, or 1,100 and a little bit. Uh, that's it there in the middle of the drought, if anyone's wondering why that looks very brown. That was about 02 or something like that in, in the beginning of the drought, so fairly brown, and we're on the left side of the range. So it's a very different topographical change in soil type from one side of that range to the other. The other side of the right side is the east, Moringo Borua side. Uh, quite different soil type. It's amazing how just one range can change it so much and it's also the top of the catchment. Right side is the Lachlan, left side is the Barambiji. So we, we're a mixed farm, we crop around about 400 hectares each year and we run about 5,500 sheep being 3,000 ewes and then their lambs of course. Uh, the rainfall 650 millimetres, that's interesting because that's very variable. Uh, usually it is around that, but uh, in the last 20 years I'd say it would be completely opposite to being even. <laughs> it's anything but. So yeah, very, very granite soil, uh, very changing soil type from top to bottom. So light soil, C, C's of 5.5, so not heavy soils at all. Uh, many people in this room have got much heavier soils than those, so uh, very interesting soil types but very old soils. So that's a little bit of the change in four generations. Uh, the two guys on the back of the uh, binder there are sailors in the Second World War and I can't remember the names of those horses but they all were very uh, well known. We had 38 draft horses at that time. And that's what we've got today. So what we did when we changed to uh, our biological system some 11 years ago when Rhonda and I saw some major differences in what we thought farming should be approaching and we uh, adopted a much more caring type of approach to our landscape. And uh, we, we started to produce uh, in initially not compost because we didn't know about compost at, those, at that stage and we were doing mineral blends and uh, foliars and then we started on to composting in 05 and it really has been an amazing journey of, of change to our landscape of our soils and uh, some very enjoyable things have happened 
over that time, both with people and the whole system of agriculture that we work with. So we began, began questioning the direction of conventional farming and that's, that came from way back in the 70s really when we were pouring on so much lime and we'd get soil tests back and we'd wonder why five years later there was no more calcium in the system. So that started to make you think, you know, how come we're putting on thousands of tonnes of lime and we're not changing it dramatically. So that really started to get me wondering, are we really mining our natural resource? And uh, that's probably what we were doing. We were only putting enough fertiliser on just to grow what we were growing in the season, but when you look at the soil test, we actually our soil tests were getting worse. So then in 2001, Rhonda uh, unfortunately got, a, got meningitis and was very ill, and that really then changed our whole outlook of our, our lives and our farming. So yeah, it's been a great journey since then. Hang on, I've just got to turn this off. Am I on? Yep. Okay, thank you. There's no red dots. Yes, the, I mean, everyone here today, I'm sure, has had challenging times in their life. And sometimes we judge those challenging times as bad. But I really think we've got to see those challenging times as an opportunity to grow and to learn. And, you know, certainly for the seven weeks they left me dying and then five and a half years of chronic fatigue, did I think that this was a, a good thing to be happening? But now 10 years on where I'm, you know, healed and healthy again, uh, despite what I went through and what's come out of it, it's been absolutely amazing. So, you know, if you are having challenges in any area of your life, it may not be just health, it might be financial, it might be relationships, that usually if you see some good in that, you'll find that that was a purpose for you to grow more in life. So propelling me on this 10 year journey has been absolutely incredible because if you said to me 11 and a half years ago, Rhonda, you'll be running a, a composting business, a biological fertiliser business, speaking around the world, holding seminars, I would have said, yeah, we'll get alive. So, you know, so many times we set goals and we think we know where we're going, but they often say when we tell God our plan, he just laughs because often there are the greater things ready for you. And I always say that everyone here and doing what we're doing, you each need to be similar to me or, and all our speakers here going out there and changing the rest of the farming community and the world because, yes, we're talking about living soils and when we started 10 years ago, you know, words like global warming, food security, you know, population explosion, you know, you can probably think of all the other things that have come on board. They weren't around back 10 years ago. Our slogan, putting life back into the land, is really what we were trying to do because we knew the soil needed the biological activity and, and, and life, but now when we look at the planet and we look at human health problems, we really have got a much larger canvas now that we have to work from. And so it needs more than just me and more than the fabulous other 14 speakers that we've got today. It needs every one of you to go out there and keep spreading the message to everyone. So if you've got a challenge at the moment, and I know lots of people do, you know, just embrace it, learn from it, and don't see it as a negative thing. See it's something that you can learn. And you know, when you get through it, you then have to help someone else. And I think that's the golden rule in life. When you learn something, then you've got to teach someone else. So, for some reason, I was chosen as this teacher to come forward. But can you believe, when I left school, I got a teacher's scholarship, and I decided I didn't want to be a teacher. But yet, what do I do now in my later life? I'm a teacher. So, it's interesting. I they got me there some way or other to be a teacher. So uh, today's going to be a great day. So when I got my guarded message of healing the soils and helping others, uh, we'd lay in bed, I never think we'd say, will we do it, won't we, will we, won't we? And in the end we said, yes, we'll start this business. And that was our first seminar in October 2002 that we had 130 people to. And we thought, my goodness, you know, this thing's got a bit of a momentum, you know, there's more people interested in it than just Rhonda Daly because back 10 years ago, as you would well know, it was a bit way out there what we were doing. Today now it is far more accepted and, and there's more people coming on board. But 10 years ago we were pretty, pretty out there. But I had always been out there with my spirituality, so it was probably nothing new to people. Oh, there, there she goes again. So um, here we are still today going again. And then it was in 2005, we got the opportunity, our daughter lived in America, to go to a composting course in Ocala, Florida. So we flew from Oklahoma to Florida and um, 
attended this course, this three-day course, and I knew a little bit about composting. My dad had done more liquid manuring on his veggie garden than composting. He wasn't one who turned and dug and whatever. And after, on the, by the third day, I said to Bill, we've got to bring this to Australia. So it took me 12 months. We started composting in April 2006. We imported the first Aeromaster equipment in September 2006 when Edwin came from America. And we now have 43, don't count them because there's a few missing, but we have now have 43 of these composting operations around Australia. So the word grows. The other thing is what's really helped our business is that all these turners are in different enterprises and in different soil types. So you might say, oh, well, Rhonda Daly lives at Young and she just knows low CEC soils and she doesn't know other soils. But when we go from the Ord River down to Dunkeld, right out to Esperance and down here into Bo Bolac, uh, up here into Chinchilla, um, we certainly got a wide variation of soils and the different crops uh, that we're growing with the compost. But it's been, th that business really, of everything that we do, I would take the humus compost, you know, and put that up the top because it's, that's what's really giving us the, the soil changing and the long-term changing results. Now, 80% of our farm soil carbon has been lost since Australian European settlement. Mm. So this is because we've used a lot of synthetic fertiliser. Um, and it also causes all the organic carbon from dead plant material to disappear. So what we've done by this, our soils are getting low in carbon, they're getting deader, and then we're going to be applying far more nitrogen fertiliser, and it overstimulates the soil microbes, causing them to overeat. So instead of turning organic carbon into stable carbon, the microbes release the carbon back into the atmosphere. So really this is, I think, the, the crux of what's happened with our agricultural system is that we've lost our humus or our organic carbon out of our soils and now we've become very dependent on everything else to keep propping it up. So the soil acidity has stolen $1.58 billion in annual agricultural production. About 50% of Australians' agricultural soils are suffering from acidity. This is low enough to reduce the yields of most agricultural crops. And in Western Australia alone, around four to $500 million is currently being lost in annual productivity. Acidification is only getting worse due to the infrequent, inadequate treatment and flawed agricultural practices. So really what we're doing, we know these things. I know I've got a little saying, we study history. Who studied history at school? Have we learned from history? No. So, you know, we know all these facts and figures. We know how to fix it. Are farmers doing it? Not everyone. So it's, it's an interesting flaw. This is very interesting. There are 388 weeds and 577 insects that are, pest, uh, are pesticide resistant. Now, get this one. Back in 1950, there were zero. So what's happened? And the thing is, and today, the, the biggest thing I hear from people who aren't in this industry is, well, show us how it works and show us why it works. And boy, does that get my blood boiling and probably puts my blood pressure up as well. Because I'll say, show me where conventional agriculture's worked. Because you may have produced food, but you've ruined your resource that you're producing it on as well. So what's happened? Pesticide leaves survivors, the individuals with life-saving genetic mutations. These survivors then repopulate and pass on their resistant genes. So the more we spray, the more we're creating these resistant pests. You know, let's hope we're not here in 20 years' time. I'll be a bit old by then, but, you know, and see that that's up to 1,000. Because unless we do something, that's going to keep growing. And at the moment, the big chemical companies are making bigger and stronger chemicals to try and wipe out these resistant ones. Very scary. We're also running on a pesticide treadmill. Between 1991 and 2011, the money each farm spends on these chemicals has more than tripled. But pesticides are not only becoming more expensive and less effective for farmers, they're actually causing damage to crops, pastures and humans. You know, when you look death in the face like I did and they told Bill that I wouldn't survive after leaving me sick for seven weeks, Nothing much else matters, really, except your health. 
because it didn't matter what we owned or what assets we had. We all have assets. Cash is a little low so mostly, but we all have assets. But it didn't matter what assets we have. You can't buy your health when you're that sick. So, you know, we're knowingly going out there harming people and yet we continue to do it. So today, I, the three days I hope is just going to be a really life-changing event for you because we've got 14, as I say, the most wonderful speakers speaking from soil to human to animal health and everything in between. So I hope when you walk out of this room that you're going to see life differently and you're going to view it differently. So yet pesticides destroy these plant-saving organisms. Glyphosate, the most popular uh, herbicide, kills beneficial soil microbes and reduces nutrient uptake as much as 80%. Well, most farmers in the, in the summer period to kill those summer weeds, particularly fleabane, are spraying four and five times. It's a known fact now, if you inhale glyphosate, it will change your DNA. So, you know, conventional saying, well, show us why this works. Well, I think we're showing them why what they're doing isn't working, basically. So 2,4-D, another popular herbicide, can kill up to 100% of the soil's fungal population. Now you may say, where does this all come from? This is all resourced information. And this is what I've just spent a lot of money on getting because a lot say, well, oh yeah, where do you get all that from? Where do you get that information from? You know, it's just a feel good thing, what you believe. But this is resourced information. So now we've got enough facts and figures to go out there and know why we're doing it. So this loss of microbial life makes the plant nutrient deficient and susceptible to what? More disease and pests. So what do we do then? Spray it again. This will scare you and I hope that through changing your management practices, but only seven of the last 22 years were profitable for the average Australian farmer. So since 1990, the average Australian farmer has failed to turn a profit. So that is pretty scary, but I do believe once you get your soils healthier, we stop so many huge imports all the time and we start recycling nutrients that we actually can turn this around. Does everyone agree with that or is everyone going, you know, that's not, or we're just not looking at the books and shutting our eyes to it and hoping that we just come out the other end? What would everyone say? Right. What you say? Mm. No one else has commenting? Is everyone else profitable? Good, I've got lots of money here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully by the... Are you saying the three days? Yes, you've got a red dot. You'll be able to answer that question to me. So I'm not going to answer that now, but you definitely will learning by getting the soil in a better condition. So that's why I've put these wonderful speakers together that are going to just guide you through and enlighten you um, as to how you can do that. And as I say to people, if your inputs are up here and your soil health is down here, don't think you're going to do that overnight. Don't think you're going to turn it around. You're going to go uh, 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 like this. Yes, you'll get results in the first year, but really long-term change, I think, will come, you know, in, in a few years where you're not going to get all those weeds. We've still got a little bit of resistant ryegrass, but then let's face it, we sowed it. You know, we wanted it as a feed, so now we call it a weed. <laughs> so, oh, so instead, the average farm has had negative revenues of 182 $158,000, So, biological farming is a preventative, preventative medicine approach to production, and that's what you're going to learn about over the next three days. Biological and humus, you know, we can say sustainable, regenerative, and we can add all these words to it, but ultimately, at the end, we want to change things, okay? So, so this ensures food production that is profitable, efficient, quality and sustainable for generations to come. Now everyone has just received this document. Okay, now if you turn over the welcome document, which you can all read at home or in bed tonight when you're so pumped. So I want you to get your bios out, no one's going to sit. So write down one or two outcomes in each area of your life where you would like to make positive, lasting change. So beside your outcome, you've got outcomes on the left. So this can be a big vision. It can be a little whatever you would like to see change. And then 
I wouldn't say put the action now because I think the actions are going to come over the next three days for you of what you're going to do. Okay, so let's start. We want an outcome on your farm that would you would like to see change or implement or have a, have a positive impact. So jot down anything and don't judge yourself on this. You know, whatever comes to mind is the best thing basically. The quickest thing. Okay, someone got, have you got, I'm not going to ask you because I want you to be, these are your personal outcomes that you would like. You call them goals, you could call them outcomes, but something you'd like to see change in, on your farm. It might be a succession plan, it might be getting your soils better, it might be using less pesticides or insecticides. Now I've just ruined this thing, but. Um, have we done something? So the next one is personal health. And that to a lot is big one. And I've got to say something today. I have my personal trainer here today, Erin Walsh. Put your hand up, Erin. Um, about nine weeks ago, um, I decided to go back to personal training. Well, I've never been to personal training. I can't say go back to it. But I really wanted to get much, much healthier than I was, drop some weight. My lung capacity was really compromised. So I now go to Erin three days a week plus exercise outside of that, and I can feel the difference. I'm going to be 60 next year, so it was like, I don't want to go into my 60s feeling tired and run down and, and not healthy. And I think having had the meningitis and the chemical poisoning certainly compromised my health. But I think everyone is living in some sort of compromised health situation now with what we eat, what we breathe in. And so stick a personal health goal down there that you would like to do. And you know, none of it's easy because we've got to put some actions to this. You know, you can write these down and never revisit them, but by the end of day three, and I know some of you are only staying today and then some are coming back Friday, there's a bit of a, a, a mix, but we want some actions that when you go home that you can stick this on the fridge and you go, okay, I'm going to take some actions in this area. Okay, the next one is really exciting, it's financial. What outcome would you like financially? What was that? Silly question. Silly question. Well, I think we all want to be profitable and we also want to get to a retiring age where we, we are financially free, basically. We were playing a game the other day and, and uh, Tony Robbins and Keith Cunningham, there's a little saying, it's cash is king. And we're playing Kid Monopoly and I was running out a bit of money and I said, oh, you know, cash is king. Anyway, the next minute, Isabella, who's just turned six, she, um, she was having the same situation. She said, cash is king. <laughs> you know, I think if we learn cash is king, we're probably right. But set some financial goal that you'd like to change or, or meet that's going to give you the lifestyle that you want or retirement that you want. Because, you know, outside health, I think financial worries are probably the worst. Absolutely. So we're going to put some actions to this. As I say, I'm not a, it's not a wealth creation seminar, um, but definitely stick some goals around it. Do some reading on it. Now, the next one is your personal development. So what areas do you want to do something that's going to develop you? It might be reading, it might be attending more seminars, um, you know, something that's going to develop you and make you feel good outside of work. Might be doing yoga, it might be doing personal training, it might be cycling, bike riding, playing bagpipes, you know. What's something that, or a book that you could read? Great books up there to read. Something that you would like to put into your life that would help with your personal development. And, and you know, build you as a person, build your knowledge. But as we said, knowledge without action is, is powerless. Just think, don't think too hard. Whatever comes to your mind is the right thing. Even as trivial, and I think this is when we first start this exercise, we, we judge, oh no, I can't put that down, that's not good enough, or that's not high enough. Don't judge it, just put it down. Because this can be something you do every day. You can do this every day to change. Now put something around your family, and then we've got to get moving on because I'm running over time already. Okay, put something around your family. You want to spend more time with your family or 
give them more money or have a succession planning. Okay, we'll move on because Caroline's going to be running out of time. Um, learning. So now we have a learning situation. Here, you're learning now for the next three days. But out of this, I hope you're going to get your actions of what you're going to do with what you've learned. And I say we learn history, but we don't learn. We study history, but we don't learn from history. So what you learn here, I want you to implement when you go home. And, you know, photocopy this piece of paper so you can actually continue to do it. Just continue this daily to monitor them. It takes 30, 30 days to change a habit. So if you start something um, different, you want to do it for 30 days. Okay, so has everyone got something down? And, and don't worry now if you haven't, because while you're sitting there, things will come to you. But if an action or if one speaker triggers something in your mind and you go, wow, that's an action I want to take, turn to that page and, and jot it down. So this is a, you know, emotion type thing. You're going to be doing it all day. 